Hi, everybody. Hello. I want to quickly apologize for my appearance. I would kind of had to run out of work and get here. Um, it's not that I, I, then I thought about it. And I'm like, well, at least I'm known for cooking. And so it doesn't really matter what I look like ever. So I just go. took it personally. I thought she didn't want to dress up for me. I know. So. I was like, oh. I had an outfit laid out. And I was like, you know what? This is going to have to do. But. Well, I have to say, um, Stephanie, I have to thank you. My bathing suit is not gonna thank you this summer, but for putting the recipe for the miso parmesan shishito peppers in your book. Oh, nice. And it, well, what's great in the book about something like that is that that vinaigrette is so tasty. Once you make it, you'll just put it on everything, on your sandwiches, on your chicken, on your... So yes, bathing suits, who cares? It's uh, all the craveable food. So this is the thing. You know, everybody knows you from Girl on the Goat and Top Chef, and you hear kind of by your accolades just thrown at you a thousand times, but um, even from personal experience, uh, you know, I was in food TV for 10 years before I got Check Please five years ago. And so everyone thinks it's like the Cinderella story, like who is this person that just kind of got the glass slipper and became, you know, super successful. So why don't we talk a little bit about that, you know, kind of journey to, to become Top Chef and, and really, you know, a restaurateur, entre well, Empresario, I guess, at this point. You know? Oh, that's a good word. I've not used that one lately. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think um, there is, you know, a, a long story of how, it, how I got there, I guess. Um, I won't go back all the way to zero, but like when I was a kid, I grew up, I think that chefs either have a mom that was a really, um, a terrible cook, so they had to fend for themselves, or they had a mom that was a great cook and they learned from them, and I was really fortunate to have the latter. My mom was an amazing cook, um, so we grew up just eating great foods all the time, um, and I got in the kitchen cooking with my mom the first time um, that I remember like truly in the kitchen cooking. We had just come back from Epcot Center. Mm -hmm. It's actually still the only time I've ever eaten in Paris. Um, <laughs> I, I'm like the worst chef ever that I haven't been to real Paris before, but I've been there at Epcot, so why bother? Um, <laughs> but when I, was, uh, when I was eight, we went to Epcot, which I still think it's amazing how you can go to all those restaurants around and I haven't been, there. that was 34 years ago. So I'm sure it's changed a little bit, but um, we came home and I um, used one of my mom's cookbooks to make crepes, but then kind of recreated this crepe with ham and cheese and mushrooms. And I can still kind of remember how it tasted to this day. Um, and my mom always claims that it tasted just like it did in Paris. Um, so that after that point, instead of just working with my mom to sort of come up with the menu for the week, we actually got together every Sunday with my sister, my mom and I, and we flipped through all the cookbooks and all of her recipes. And she had all the gourmet magazines, which she sold at like a yard sale. And I was like, why did you sell all those? But anyways, um, my aunt has some that I have taken some home. Um, we flipped through all of the recipes and we would put a menu on our refrigerator that had what we were gonna have every night of the week. So our friends could pick a day they wanted to come over for dinner. Uh, my friend Sue, who's this tiny little person, would come over for roast beef and Yorkshire pudding night all the time, and she could, my mom would be like, oh, Sue's coming over, we need to make like an extra tray of Yorkshire pudding, because she loved it so much. <laughs> um, but it was just a fun thing, and then my, after I started actually cooking, I would take over the cooking sometimes um, and get in the kitchen, and my sister and I were always there making mushu pork with my mom. Um, my mom made her own mandarin pancakes, which you can still get on the duck duck goat menu to this day. Um, yeah, I was just really fortunate. So that was my childhood, the way I grew up. But then I still decided to go to college for, I went to University of Michigan. Any go blue people? Woo, go blue. Go blue. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes I go to places like in other states and I say that and they're like, wow. it's just dead silent. <laughs> um, but I know a lot of uh, Ann Arbor folks end up here. Um, so went to Michigan thinking I was going to the business school, but it's a very, it's hard to get into, right? I can just, I could say that, I think. I mean, I was having a little too much fun freshman year, so I didn't quite have the grades to get into the business school. And so I was kind of left being like, well, what am I going to do now? So I became a general studies major for a little bit until my dad was like, you're not just going to be a general studies major. You have to pick something. <laughs> so I picked sociology um, purely for the fact that there was only classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I was able to go to class from, um, from like, 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. twice a week, and then I spent the rest of the week, I actually got my first restaurant job at the Olive Garden, um, and I was a hostess. Soup salad and breadsticks. Yeah, <laughs> soup salad and breadsticks, um, which when you're a server and you're running your butt off, because everybody wants free soup salad and breadstick <laughs> refills on endless pasta night, that's always the best. Um, but I, I started off as a hostess, and you wear a salad tie, and that was super fun, and... Um, 
And then I worked my way up to being a server, which I was terrible because I was really shy at the time, so I'm, not, I'm surprised actually. I would never have hired myself <laughs> at this time. But, um, but it was such a great way to just learn that the restaurant industry was something that interested me. It's like everybody that worked there, it was just off campus, so it wasn't people from, and from University of Michigan, um, but just a bunch of people that were just really fun to me. Like they all just were like a little off their rocker like everybody in the restaurant industry. So um, I just felt a little bit more at home than maybe sitting in class. So when I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do, my dad actually said, he's like, why don't you just go to culinary school? And I thought, why didn't we talk about this before? <laughs> um, but I mean, you're the one that dished out the cash for college. Um, so I decided to, um, I still wanted to finish school because I think it, you know, University of Michigan was so much fun. I got to go to the Rose Bowl my senior year, it was great. Um, but then I went to culinary school right after. And as soon as I walked into culinary school, that's when I just knew, like I had found my people. From the first day I walked in, I was like, at that point I was never late for class. I couldn't wait for class. I was so excited about everything. Um, and you just kind of can tell when you've found the right thing for you. Yeah. Um, so was in Arizona for that. Um, found my way back to Chicago. I actually came, sorry if this answer to this question has turned into this like no, long, well, like, it was, it's like I wasn't thinking you were gonna give us a 20 minute answer. But, <laughs> no, I love it, it's okay. great, it's great. We're almost, we're almost <laughs> caught up. I've just gotten to like, Chicago. And thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it to go a little bit faster. So got to Chicago. Um, I actually came out here to just visit some friends from Ann Arbor and I had been living in Scottsdale and I just didn't go back. I had my stuff shipped out because Chicago's just way better. Um, I like came out and went to a street fair, went to a Cubs game and everybody's just so amazing here that I just felt, again, like I had found my home, I had found my people. Um, I was born here, but I hadn't spent time here as an adult. So um, I had my stuff shipped out. I worked at a couple restaurants. I worked at um, Vong when it was here with Sean George. Um, then I worked at Spring for Sean McLean when that opened. Um, <clears throat> Then I left there to go be a sous chef at Latash, this little bistro up in um, Andersonville. It's not there anymore, but, and Lynn is really awesome, the owner, but it was called, this is just funny, the title, or the name is Latash, meaning the spot, and she thought she was naming it like the hot spot, but it actually, in French, it's more like the spot on your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. <laughs> because it's like if you eat the food and you really love it, you're yeah. gonna get like spots yeah, all over exactly. your clothes. Yeah, there so. you go, that could be her story for it. Um, I was working with Dale Levitsky at the time, who has left Chicago now, but he was on Top Chef also, he was mm -hmm. one of the faux hawkers. Um, and I worked there for a while, one of the cooks one day, Dale had gone out of town and left me in charge of the specials and just left me in charge of the kitchen. And one of the cooks looked over and he's like, you're really good at this, you should just open your own restaurant. And I was like, oh, okay. And so um, the next week I quit my job and I just started working on opening a restaurant. Um, I was 27 you, at the time. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you were only 27. Yeah. I, remember, I don't know if anyone remembers Scylla, but it was, when I was in culinary school, it was my favorite restaurant. Oh, thank and you. And it was incredible. So it's just funny, when you went on Top Chef, I was, I read in the paper Scylla was closing, and I remember being really sad and telling my boyfriend, now husband at the time, I can't believe it, Scylla's closing, and then, Ba boom like right. they announced that Steph was gonna be on Top Chef yeah. season four. Season four, and not because of that. I actually had sold it to Takashi, um, which I was very excited to sell it to him. Mm -hmm. um, I had sold it to him a couple weeks before, and it was like our last week of service when Top Chef called to see if I wanted to go on the show, and it's kind of when I started thinking everything happens for a reason, so I was like, the timing couldn't have been better. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people that left their restaurants for like five weeks um, to go film, and I couldn't imagine doing that with such a small staff. Um, so yeah, it all worked out, and then, you know, blah, 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 things just started to kind of fall into place. Well, so, okay, so when you came, let's talk, all right, so, whew, that was a lot of information yeah, to digest. I was like, all right, I can just throw away all my first questions. <laughs> <laughs> we can go Done. back, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. And, um, but let's talk about, let's rewind a little bit then, and, um, you know, because you were born in Evanston, but then grew up in Connecticut, went to, you know, University of Michigan, went to Scottsdale, and then you said you kind of came back here, but um, I guess, like, what, what kept you here? You know, you can, and especially at this point in your career, you know, as a chef, you can kind of pack your knives and, and take them anywhere. <laughs> <you know>? Yes. <laughs> um, I, Chicago's just awesome. I think um, everybody has a city that kind of feels like home to them. And my family, all, my mom grew up in the suburbs. My dad grew up in the city. Um, my family, a lot of them still love, live in Evanston and some other suburbs. Um, but it just feels, I just feel connected to the people here. It's just kind of like cool, normal people. I don't know. When I lived in some other cities, it just didn't feel right. 
Um, like, I love going to New York to visit, but I couldn't see myself living there. Um, I loved living in Scottsdale because the weather's really great, but I couldn't see myself staying there. Um, so, you kick yourself you know, every winter, do you think? I know, I know, Scottsdale. I know. And I, there, I will say that I will stay in Chicago for, you know, this is for the unforeseeable future, but you will see me living on a beach at some point <laughs> in my life. Um, and, yeah, I just, I need some warm weather at some point. But I... I just love it, and I think, you know, now that I've gotten my restaurants open here, I think I chose the perfect place. The city's so supportive of their local chefs, um, and I think that you don't see it the same in other cities as you do here. So it's really just to the people that live here that are so excited. Chicago's so excited to be the best that we can at everything, just as a city, I think. I mean, I think that's true in, like, many things. You know, we're very, you know, we really get behind our sports, we really get behind, um, you know, everybody in the city gets behind each other and tries to be supportive, so I think that you can really feel that in the restaurant industry. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You see that even, we always say that about the Chuck Plays audience, they're so loyal, you know, yeah. and, and they're so loyal to the chefs, and I think that's great. I mean, they, that's why chefs can do all these interesting things, and, and um, kind of newcomers can open their own restaurant and see success in it, where, you know, that's not the same thing, and, you know, New York or LA or Las Vegas, which won't even look at you if you don't already have 10 restaurants and a, two TV shows, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, but on the note of Chicago, you know, Chicago, I've obviously always thought Chicago was a great culinary city, and obviously you have too, which is why you've chose to put roots here, but, um, you know, we've really seen um, national recognition, especially really in the last couple of years. You know, James Beard moved their award ceremony here. Uh, last year we were named, you know, Bon Appetit's best restaurant city of the year. Why do you think we're finally on a national platform? Um, I mean, I think it has to do with a lot of the chefs that kind of helped establish. You know, we look back to Charlie Trotter, who every chef in the city will say, you know, thank you to him for really putting Chicago on the map, I think, for that level of restaurant. Um, now we have Grant Ackett's, who is, you know, one of the best restaurants in the world for not just being, you know, not just about the food, but about taking it to a whole other place. It's, mm -hmm. it's theater, it's an experience, it's everything. Um, I actually just got to go to dinner there a couple weeks ago for a charity event, and I thought we were just going to have some appetizers, and we sat down for the full gamut, the full dinner, and it was just, it was mind-blowing and amazing. Um, so it's some of the chefs that have really, like, laid down the roots, you know, Rick Bayless, who, mm -hmm. um, has been going for a number of years and just has opened amazing restaurants, but also just put his name, you know, nationally. So I think it's just like all the chefs that have come along um, have really like laid the foundation. And I guess like now I'm actually, I always before I thought of myself as like the younger generation, but now I have chefs, or there's chefs that are, that used to work for me. So now I'm one of the, the old chefs too. <laughs> um, but kind of hardly, maybe hardly. I don't know. It's a, I always think of Chicago as a family tree of chefs where there's like those chefs that kind of started, you know, and carry Nahabedian and then people work for them and they go open restaurants and then people work for us and they're going to open restaurants and it kind of just keeps going. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I, it's amazing. And mo so many people stay here you know, in Chicago, which does, again, doesn't always happen. They, a lot of times, you'll see in other cities, you know, they come, they get their restaurant experience under whatever name chef it is they want, and then, uh, you know, leave. I guess the only yeah. defect is we have now is like Detroit seems to be taking a lot of our chefs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you, when you look to go to other cities, you have to think, even in Chicago, like we're very supportive of the chefs that are from Chicago, but even when some other big name chefs try to come into the city and open restaurants, they don't get quite the same support. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and I would name some, but I'm not going to, but um, <laughs> where it's just because, you know, every city kind of supports their local chefs. You want to see people that have come up working in your restaurants. Um, but there's definitely some markets like Detroit that haven't had the same generational thing going. Right. So like having some great chefs from Chicago maybe go put their roots in there is so great because they can help that culinary scene mm -hmm. start to develop. I say like, you know, Chicago is, is kind of working as almost like a pollinator for other areas in the Midwest. You know, even you're seeing it in St. Louis has a great culinary scene now. Um, you're seeing Detroit's growing. Um, there's just, it's, it's been fascinating to kind of watch that and watch these kind of roots take place. I keep saying the Midwest is having a moment. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You know, and the Midwest is a challenging place for culinary just from our it's not like LA, they have like everything you could want all right. year long. Or in Portland and Seattle, all the seafood and things like that. So, I mean, of course we're able to get all of those items now, but um, it's, you know, every city has their own challenges and things like that. And I think people still to this day will say, well, Chicago's known as a meat and potatoes town. So how, you know, how does it feel to serve pig face or things <laughs> like that? And I'm like, I don't think Chicago's a meat and potatoes town anymore. Maybe, you know, I don't know how many years ago, but many, many years ago, I think that, um, 
you know, Chicago as now seen is just as much of a foodie city as any other. Absolutely. Um, I never use that word when I'm talking either. Let's strike that one from the record. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So let's talk about some of the people you worked under. You know, it's interesting that you say that you feel like you almost need to be more creative as a Chicago chef because you don't have this bounty of beautiful produce year-round, et cetera. And it's funny because in an interview, Sean McLean, one of uh, your mentors, I guess, I, I assume, and since you worked under him, um, had said the same thing. So why don't you talk about um, the chefs you worked under and maybe what you kind of took from each of those experiences? Sure. Um, I, the first couple of chefs I worked for, well, the first chef I worked for out of culinary school, um, I won't say his name, but he was in Arizona and he was just a screamer. And he would just like scream at us all the time. And I was like afraid to go to work and I was afraid to make mistakes and I didn't want to be the one getting yelled at. And so, and I've never liked getting yelled at in life anyway. So um, I just always kind of did my thing and was very quiet, but I didn't like the, having that air in the kitchen and kind of, I learned from that kitchen, I am not going to be a screamer. Um, and then I went to work for Chef Bo McMillan at the Sanctuary in Arizona. This is on my way here. There's just two, so it won't be a long thing, but. Um, <laughs> I just spent time with him at an event a few weeks ago, and he was just really fun. Like the the kitchen, we listened to music while we were prepping. We had such a good time. Everybody was happy in the kitchen all the time. The front and back of the house got along really well, and it was just one big team. And I took away from that, like that. Um, then I worked for when I first got here. I worked for Jean George. Um, again, kind of a scary kitchen. We weren't allowed to laugh. Um, and the chef literally like went through like with his finger like this on the edges to look for dust, which is important and I've become a complete neat freak in my restaurants. Um, my cooks probably think I do do that, but, but they're allowed to laugh and I encourage it very much. Um, then I worked for Sean McLean, I think um, was where I probably, I got to work all the stations and learned so much from him just on his creativity and he used a lot of Asian ingredients, which I use to this day. We always went up to some really cool markets in Chicago. That's really where I first learned that those kind of places existed for getting really great ingredients. Um, And then, yeah, went to work for Dale Levitsky and again, we danced around the kitchen. I think I decided to find places where you got to listen to music and dance around the kitchen during the day. And now we very much encourage that in our restaurants. Not that there's focus on what you're doing and it's the most important is to make sure that the consistency, you know, obviously not music to the point of it not being safe, um, but just making sure that everybody's having fun and that you're excited to go to work. I mean, cooks spend, my line cooks at Girl and the Goat spend, you know, 10 hours in the restaurant um, four days a week. So they spend a lot of time with each other and they're working their butts off. So we want to make sure that in the hours before service, they get to listen to music and during service, we take the food seriously, but we try to laugh at the same time. And I think you can see it in the food. So um, it's kind of related, but not really, but I feel like I want to talk to you about this as a female chef who's achieved a lot of success. And I hate qualifying you. You're just an amazing chef, but I'm going to ask you about the Me Too movement and kind of how you're seeing that. I mean, the culinary industry is kind of notoriously um, misogynistic and chauvinistic. Um, How are you seeing, are you seeing changes in it? What kind of changes do you hope to see? Sure. I, you know, it's an interesting thing that's happening in so many different um, fields. And I think it's obviously all for the good. I think everybody should be comfortable in their workplace. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody should be comfortable in life in general. Um, And we, you know, in our restaurants, we've always had um, an HR department and we've always tried to make sure that everybody has someone they can talk to. We always say, hey, talk to whichever manager you're most comfortable with and try to create the most um, comfortable environment possible. But there's always going to be, you know, little things among staff members that might happen. So, um, but what's happening out with some other people that have sort of... um, where it's come out that terrible things have been happening for many, many years, I think that it's something that kind of had to happen, like this big, like last like year or two of these um, major big name chefs in the industry um, where things are being revealed. It had to kind of happen that way to get it to trickle down to just like every day in kitchens. Um, so as much as, you know, it became, of course the chatter, I, is the chefs that have been, um, you know, part of the media are people that I've known for many years and to sort of like know that these things have been happening. It's a little bit shameful to be part of an industry where that's been happening. Um, but at the same time, now it's taking the pride to know that that's not what our industry is all about. 
um, and that we have the power to sort of make it better. And I think, you know, I was very fortunate as a woman to come up in the industry where it didn't necessarily hold me back. You know, I think in all the interviews that I've done, I feel like there should be some story that I should be able to tell about how I was treated badly because I was a woman. I, I was very fortunate that, that I don't really have those kind of stories. Um, there was one kitchen that I worked in where a lot of the guys in the kitchen always thought that I got special treatment because I was a girl. Um, I always got to go to the events, like the chef always picked me to go to the events with him and um, I was always, you know, first to go to, yeah, get to do things like that. And I was like, well, that's just because I work harder than you. Um, <laughs> Which so, was probably true. <laughs> it was true. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I think it's, I always put my head down and just did my job and I still was having fun, but at the same time really focused. So. And I just happened to be in the right places, I think. So I was really fortunate, and I hope that the industry just gets to a point where women don't feel, um, or anyone, whether it's about your race, whether it's about your um, sexual, you know, anything about you, you shouldn't feel um, that that affects your, your work life or your chance to succeed. So hopefully, you know, all I can do is really like make sure that it doesn't happen in our restaurants. Right. Um, and hopefully that just kind of, it seems like it's spreading throughout the industry and people are realizing that, um, there's things that are just, you know, just can't happen. Things have to change. It's just, it's not okay anymore. It's just not okay. You know, it's interesting. I was reading some statistics on female um, chefs, and it's, it's so sad. It's only a little over 20% of female chefs in the industry. I mean, that's very small. And female majority owners of restaurants is about a third. Um, do you see that? I mean, why do you think that is? You know, as someone who's obviously been able to run a business, you know, beyond win every TV show, basically every competition, Stephanie <laughs> enters, she's won, um, and managed to also snag fan favorite while winning the competition, and um, you know, and on these instances, I mean, what do you see that changing? Do you think like why do you think that is? Um, I mean, I think there's different parts to it. I think some of it. Um, you know, of course, is due to um, maybe women getting held back for just being women. I think, you know, I, there are many girls that'll say they go to an interview to be, and maybe this is years ago, go to an interview to be a line cook because they want to be a chef eventually, and they're like, oh, do you want to work in our pastry program? Or something like that, and I, I think that that's kind of changing. Um, but, I, I mean, another part of it is, and I don't mean this to not be... Um, to be negative against women or anything like that, but it's very hard to have a family and to be a chef at the same time. Um, I kind of waited, I just, I'm gonna be 42 in October and I have an almost two year old. I waited until I already had three restaurants open before I had a baby. Um, and that's just the choice that I personally made. And not that you can't do it all, not that you can't have a baby and be a chef, but because of the hours and everything that go into it, and to become a chef, you really have to you know, work 15 to 18 hour days to get to that level. Um, I think it's just, it's kind of a balancing act. So I think some women maybe do make the choice that they want to step back and take other roles in culinary. But I don't know, you know, I think there's, Hopefully, like in our kitchens, we have probably half and half, half men, half women, um, which is great, and all like amazingly talented. And I don't know what'll happen with the men or the women. Who's gonna stick around and become chefs? I know um, one of my sous chefs right now. I call her my. She like looks like my daughter. She's like she has the same hair as me. She's like my body double. When she's expediting people, are like Stephanie. She's like, no, I'm like 24 years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she loves it. Uh, but she reminds me of me when I was her age. She's like a go-getter. She works her butt off. She's really smart. She um, has an amazing palate. She like wants to be a chef. She wants to run the kitchen, and she will. You know, I can see that drive in her. Um, and she's not going to let anything, you know, get in her way. And I think to be, there are many women like that. And if they just keep that mindset that they can do it, and that's like we just need to encourage that so that we can get more women that like know that they can do it. Um, and then, you know, it might always be that there are, it depends, you know, what sort of happens. It is just a, it can be tricky to um, try to fit it all in, I guess. Definitely. Um, well, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. I, I'm, I, I never lie and say that it's an easy thing. I like, I, when I'm at work, I feel like I, um, you know, I'm not being as good of a mom as I would like to be. And when I'm hanging out with my little one, I feel like I know 100% that I don't do my job as well as I did before I had a baby. Because I used to work like 18 hour days and I no longer do. Um, but you, you figure it out and you can still do very well. Right. Um, you just have to figure out how to do things a little differently and life just adjusts a little bit. And everybody's um, family life is different, everybody's work life is different, so. 
Well, so on that note then, how do you make decisions on what to do? So when Iron Chef Gauntlet comes calling and says, hey, we need you to be away and compete in this, what is it that makes you decide to go ahead and do some new project? Uh, well, I was able to bring my baby. Um, <laughs> he lived in, he stayed at the hotel while I was filming. Um, now I really do take into account, you know, is it worth my time to go and um, kind of leave my family for this, to leave work for this? Um, so kind of being a little bit smarter about the decisions I make. Um, but there's so many things, there's always so many fun things going on that it's really hard to say no. And I, right. I'll go on a trip and I'm like, while I'm there, I of course feel guilty if I'm away without him. But um, I think there's so many great opportunities. It's really thinking about the ones that can either, if it's for a great cause, I just got back from New York and did an event with Marcus Samuelson. Mm -hmm. um, he created an event called Harlem Eat Up. Um, and it's just a really cool event, just trying to promote Harlem and really celebrate that part of the city. And um, I just love everything that he does. And it's just a, it seems like something that was very close to his heart and I wanted to go support it. So I went and did the event for um, two days this week. Um, but there might be some events that don't seem to have that sort of um, personal touch to them now that I might pass on. Um, but you know, when Iron Chef came up, I was like, they were relaunching the brand. And it was something that I grew up watching. I think like many people in the industry grew up watching the original Iron Chef and then watching Iron Chef America. And it kind of just went away for like five years. Um, and so when they announced that they were bringing it back and then they called and asked if I wanted to do it, I thought, why not? Let's just <laughs> give it a go. Although I'm a really sore loser, so I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> Well, it must have felt really, really yeah. good to beat those guys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so tell us, I guess, um, I feel like we have to dish. You're probably so sick of talking about Top Chef, about all the TV things. But I guess, let's. what was the, kind of your favorite takeaway or moment from Top Chef? And then also um, Iron Chef Gauntlet. Give um, us some dish on it. Yeah, let's something see. Something dishy. Top Chef. Ooh, something dishy. I remember um, Matt, some producer from Magical Elves told me that they wake you guys up at like four in the morning after you've oh, been yeah. cooking all day so that you'll cry on camera. Oh yeah, no, they try to <laughs> bring out the worst in everyone. Um, yeah, Top Chef, it's so funny because Top Chef and Iron Chef have very different approaches to food television. So Top Chef, and both really great shows. Um, I still watch Top Chef. My sous chef, Joe Flam, was the winner this season, so that was a really proud Another moment. Another um, Or he was my sous chef now, of course, running Spiaggia, which so proud of. Mm -hmm. um, again, the old chef now, young chef, what? Um, I, uh, back when we did Top Chef, so they basically don't tell you anything that's gonna happen. I don't, do you guys watch Top Chef? Anybody out there? Um, they don't tell you anything that's gonna happen. So you're sequestered for five weeks with a bunch of strangers. You're not allowed to call your family, read books, watch TV, do anything. It's like full sequestered. And they never tell you what the schedule is for the next day. So you go to bed and you're just like, mm, we'll just see what happens. <laughs> um, I was really lucky that my window was right next to the backyard of this house. There was nine of us living in bunk beds in a bedroom. Everybody's like, that house was so gorgeous. I'm like, yeah, if you're a party of, or for a family of four, um, not for 18. <laughs> Um, but my, my bed was right next to the window and there was rocks in the backyard and I could hear them walking up on the pebbles in the morning when they were going to come in and it, I'm a sound sleeper but light enough in the morning that I like heard that and I would go jump in the shower one to beat all the other nine women to, into the one shower um, but two I was like I am not going to be that person they can wake up with a camera because um, they love doing that um, not that I, I look the exact same in the morning because I don't do anything to bother trying to look better um, that's the way I don't um, but yeah, I, I always just wanted to beat that. So they, they get you up, you do these long challenges. There was one challenge that I think was probably pushed us as much as we could. We did a wedding for someone and I actually, I've met the people many times since then. I was like, I can't believe you actually let us cook your wedding. <laughs> so trusting, it was like their real wedding. Um, we, they had to stay up overnight doing it. So we like started at like eight in the morning, went shopping and whatnot, got everything to do this wedding and then stayed up and basically didn't get to sleep that night. They're like, they had cots in the back room that you could, but who's gonna go take a nap while everybody else is on their team is cooking? You definitely would get kicked off for that one. Um, so I stayed up all night and made a wedding cake, which I've, I couldn't make a wedding cake again if I tried. I was like sitting there rolling fondant out by hand. They don't roll fondant out by hand. There's like little, you put it through like a pasta machine or through a machine. My hands were like bruised from rolling out all the fondant. 
um, which it ended up almost, it was all falling off the cake because my, I was, I got off the show and my pastry chef friend, I like looked at her, not that she would have known to even tell me this, but I was like, you could have mentioned that you're supposed to put icing underneath the fondant <laughs> to hold it in place. So I'd put all this fondant on and by the time we got there, and this was a tall cake. I mean, it was a good like six layers. I had memorized a cake recipe. I like made the whole cake and all the situation. Um, I had to put a bunch of flowers on it to cover up where the fondant was kind of falling off, but it still looked really, it still, I was like the next morning, like in my, you know, we're still like going and we cooked all the way through the next day to the actual wedding. I just kept looking at it. I'm like, I made a damn wedding cake. Like, <laughs> I can't believe I made a wedding cake. Um, so that was fun. I mean, the whole experience, I got to meet amazing friends. I have Antonia from LA is one of my best friends from the show. She's actually coming out to do um, Harvest Fest with us, our oh, festival, cool. which we can get to later. We have to talk about it about um, this September. And there's just, I have chef friends all over the country now through Top Chef and through other things and through all the different things that I've gotten to do that every time you go to a city, you can go to their restaurants or they help you find like the hidden gem restaurants in their cities. So it's just kind of this big like strange fraternity of like chefs around yeah. the country that are, yeah, just kind of friends and supporting each other, which is cool. So that's the best takeaway from Top Chef for sure. Yeah. And Gail Simmons is awesome and I love her. <laughs> and so then with um, Iron Chef Gauntlet, I guess, um, how, how did that feel? Did you expect, I mean, it was, you know, Iron Chef, very different. So their approach is no drama whatsoever. They don't really care, you know, they don't want to catch you sleeping or like mm -hmm. bother with that. Um, we got to stay in a hotel, we got to go out to dinner, I'll hang out, mm -hmm. and I had my um, little one with me with like a nanny sleeping in the room next door. So that, because he used to wake up every like hour and a half. Um, and I'm like, <laughs> I, of course I still heard it from the room next door, but I'm like, um, we, it was just kind of, you got to live a normal life and then just get up early in the morning and you knew what time to be there um, to go film the show. Because to them, it's just all about the food. It's all about the ingredients, mm -hmm. all about just making dishes, but making these hard challenges. Um, and you would think that, um, you know, they kind of lift up the thing and like two minutes later, you have to make dishes from it. And I think having one Top Chef like 10 years prior, I just didn't want to go on Iron Chef and then... <laughs> totally suck. Because <laughs> like, I feel like there's much higher expectations. It's really yeah. different when you go on a show as someone who's a newcomer. Or like when I opened my first restaurant, Scylla, I was 27. I was just this young woman where it was like, when press people talked to me, it was like, wow, you're so, this young woman who's opened this restaurant. And then when I opened Girl and the Goat, it's like, uh, you're a top chef, like this better be good. Um, so same thing going on Iron Chef, it's like, well, you won Top Chef, like maybe, you know, maybe she can't do this anymore. Um, so I think that made me like really wanna, each day I went in there, I'm like, you cannot, cannot <laughs> lose this challenge. Um, and there was definitely moments where, like I had to do a big cook-off against Shota, who's on it. Did you guys, anybody watch that season? Shota Nakajima is like one of my newest favorite people. I love him, he's so funny. Um, but the challenge is there where you had to do three dishes by yourself in one hour. It's really hard. Yeah. It's a very, like the other chefs are standing there watching you just sweat your ass off while you're trying to make three dishes in an hour. And it might not seem, but like when you're trying to make it three dishes that you've had like two minutes to plan out in your head um, and you're trying to make it these amazing things that'll blow the minds of the judges. And it's just a lot to pull off in an hour. Um, usually on Iron Chef America, you have like two sous chefs to help right. you. Um, so doing it by yourself, you're like, please have some sort of secret reveal of a sous chef right now. <laughs> um, but that never happened. Like, um, where's my lifeline? <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was awesome. I mean, what a great experience. And then going against, you know, the last challenge, um, Bobby Flay, Michael Simon, and then the way that they did that was actually filmed in two days. Mm -hmm. So I cooked against Bobby Flay and Michael Simon the first day just because I had chosen it that way. They showed the peppers, I picked Bobby Flay, they showed the cheese, I picked Bobby or Michael Simon. And then I was going to sleep that night knowing, I was like, all right, there's no way it's not gonna be fish. Like I get the game that they're playing here and I've played into it the way that I wanted to play into it. And so I went to bed knowing I was gonna wake up the next morning and cook against Morimoto in a fish challenge. Like, it's like <laughs> the worst trying to fall asleep night ever. I ended up watching some old battles of his, which was the worst idea ever. <laughs> because he, I was like watching, I'm like, I wish I was sequestered right now. Um, I was watching them and I was like, he scores a perfect score in like every battle that he's ever done. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool experience. I, um, and Alton Brown is like now one of my favorite people. He's so amazing and just knows so much. I always wish I could just ask him questions in normal life in the kitchen. Um, like if he was watching my every day when I'm trying to figure out new recipes and new doughs and stuff. Well, okay, so on the note of trying to cook three dishes in one hour. Um, I wanna get to your book before we open it up to, to the audience for questions. Um, that is always, I think, the biggest blunder of somebody entertaining. 
you know, they go from like zero to a hundred and they try to cook basically a restaurant, coursed out, composed dishes, you know, and a restaurant has a kitchen brigade behind it. And so you heard it here, Top Chef says three courses in one yeah, hour it's a lot. <laughs> is tough. So what would you say is kind of like your advice, um, you know, because your new book, Gather and Graze, is all about home entertaining. Like what would you say, what would your advice be to the, the home chef, home I mean, entertainer? When I'm cooking, for, I have my two-year-old's birthday party this Saturday. I'm going to go to the restaurants and take sauces from each of them and stuff and shop there and then take it home. No, I'm just um, <laughs> So come it. by. We'll give you some sauces. But, um, <laughs> but what's great, but what this book does, it has, in this book, there's all those sauces and you can kind of, I always try to plan ahead. You want to make sure that, I mean, if it's Thanksgiving week or if you're just having a party the next day, um, definitely want to plan ahead and make some sauces the day before and kind of approach it in the way that we do in the restaurants where you have your mise en place to say it in a fancy way, but where you just have everything ready to go and you just have to finish it. Um, I think that, you know, don't try to do too many things that need to be cooked like a la minute. Like, yeah. uh, you know, you want to have a lot of things. There's a bunch of braised things in there I think are great mm -hmm. for entertaining. Um, I love doing it. Now that it's, oh, I was going to say now that's finally nice outside. And then <laughs> it, it super wasn't today. Um, Scottsdale's looking really nice. Yeah, Scottsdale sounds nice. Um, well, I think in the next couple of days it'll finally be nice outside and we can all get outside and do some grilling. Um, that's what I always do for entertaining and I, mm -hmm. I always make a lot of dishes that are are okay serve cold or room temperature and have one or two hot things. If you try to have too many hot things, I mean, I only have one oven at my house. I know a lot of people have like two ovens or even three ovens. I'm super jealous. I don't know where these people live, but um, I just have one. Um, so if you have too many things that you're trying to serve hot, that can be very stressful. Um, I don't even get how to, I, Thanksgiving, I'm like, you know what? Those green beans are just not gonna be hot. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but really just, there's so many good things that you can serve that don't have to be hot. And also just kind of have things come out in a flow. So like put out some sort of dish and have people eat it. It doesn't have to be all on the table at the same time. I think that's what the book is called, Gather and Graze. It's meant to gather with your friends and your family or you know, whomever, and then just put out a bunch of food as it's ready and just graze. Like, it should just be fun. That's what food is supposed to be about. So what would you say your top five pantry staples? I know fish sauce is in there. Fish sauce. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So Ernie, my little two-year-old, came to Girl on the Goat the other day, and my husband ordered the green beans for them to eat. It's like the only vegetables that my husband will eat, by the way. Um, and Ernie just took them and sucked all the fish sauce off and put the green beans back. <laughs> and like most parents would be upset about this. I was like, yes! <laughs> he loves fish sauce. Um, fish sauce. Uh, miso. I love miso. Mm -hmm. um, soy sauce or tamari. We kind of use them, not interchangeably, because they taste different, but we use them both for different reasons. Um, a favorite hot sauce, I mean, sambal is a great thing to have around, or you can make your own hot sauce, so you can have Frank's Red hot sauce, or sriracha, sort of whatever one of your favorite hot sauces is. Um, mm, I've named all the salty things that I like, and the spicy. I mean, vinegars, and I'd be, it's hard for me to pick my favorite vinegar. We actually mix balsamic and sherry vinegar together, and mm -hmm. um, it tastes almost like Chinese black vinegar. But just keep it, you have to have vinegar around, or like pickled items. Yeah, um, yeah there's a I whole section that you in the back on quick pickles. On pickled items. Yeah, I think like we started p putting pickled things on everything. I just did some pickled green strawberries that came out really tasty yesterday. And what's great is the liquid, then you can make into the best, you could make a non-alcoholic non beverage, which would be great too, but you can also make like some tasty cocktails for your party with all the pickling liquids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice shrub for it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Shrubs became so popular. It's like, oh, it's just some pickling liquid. There yeah. you go. And very good for you. It's true. Well, that's what they say, at least. I know. Detox and retox. <laughs> that's what I yes. say. So. <laughs> Gin and shrub. It's so good for you. Exactly. So it all negates, you know? <laughs> so you're having a two-year-old's birthday party, so um, you're going to have a mix, obviously. I assume you're going to have parents. You're not taking on a bunch of uh, kids yourself. <laughs> so no. yeah. how do you... These days, I feel like everybody has um, allergies or food sensitivities or just, you know, they're making choices about food for, you know, whatever stand they're taking. And um, it's just really different now. Entertaining is so much harder. I'm like, right. you're off the list. Like, I literally just cross <laughs> people off. I'm like, they're never coming to a dinner party at my house because I just, I don't know what I would serve them. So I guess, how do you suggest someone approaches that? I mean, because you're probably about to have that right. this weekend. Um, yeah, I think it's, a, for me, instead of just picking one main thing that you're serving, just have sort of something that has a variety to it. Like, I think for this party, we're going to do 
Um, well, it's a pineapple themed party, just because I like pineapples. Um, but we're not gonna serve only pineapples. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna do tacos off the grill, where we'll have beef tacos, chicken tacos, fish tacos. You can have like a veggie tacos, and then everybody can kind of make their own, but at the same time have just a lot of different things out so people can make their own choices. Um, if you try to focus on just one entree, then you end up having to, I mean, then it's just like in the restaurants where people have their gluten-free or their vegan or things like that. But if you have a lot of different um, varieties out there and let people just kind of, you know, pick and choose and graze on their own, then I think it makes it a little less stressful. Definitely. And uh, so Ernie's an adventurous eater. He is. Yeah, Ernie, I think maybe because, you know, I was tasting everything at the restaurants every day when I was pregnant. We actually opened Duck, Duck, Goat when I was seven months pregnant. As um, one does. <laughs> yeah, as one does. It actually worked out great because I was so stressed about opening a restaurant that I forgot about I was so uncomfortable being pregnant. Well, except for every morning when I put on my compression socks that I could hardly reach to put on my socks. And I was like, <laughs> Gary, help me put on my socks. Um, I like trying to pull up my sweet pregnancy like chef pants. It was great. Um, but aside from that, then I, you know, I was so focused on the restaurant. And then at the same time, um, because I knew that I was going to leave for, I left for like two weeks. Um, I knew that I was going to leave for a couple of weeks. I knew that I had to get the restaurant set up to a point that it'd be okay without me. So I wouldn't be thinking about it, of course. Um, so it kind of had me open the restaurant in a different way. So it was really great. Um, I just went on a tangent. I forgot that what we were talking about completely. <laughs> we're talking about Ernie. And then I got an pregnancy brain eater. and it well, never went interesting. away. interesting. You know, kids' palates are so much oh, more yes, sophisticated Oh, yes, adventurous eater. Now. So I was... He was eating all sorts of things, you know, while I was pregnant. Um, and he comes into the restaurants all the time. So we taste um, small versions of all the dishes every day at, um, at Girl on the Go. And then we taste um, probably about 75% of the menu at Duck Duck Goat every day, kind of rotating through some of the things. And then we taste um, five or six dishes each shift at Little Goat, just to make sure that everything's coming out right. Um, and I tasted the line at Little Goat in the morning. So Ernie had tasted many different things. So I like to think that's why he um, likes different things. But he also comes to the restaurants at tasting sometimes. So he'll come to Girl on the Goat and eat duck tongues and like scallops and um, just try all the things. And he just, you know, there's some, it's like the thing he doesn't like is just like chicken breast, <laughs> which is so, I'm like, why doesn't he just like chicken? He's like, can you turn this into Taiwanese chicken strips or something, mom? <laughs> or put some Szechuan spice on here? Um, um, that'll be fun when he says Szechuan for the first time. He hasn't said that one yet. We'll work on it. So do you think that we have a future uh, top chef junior or master chef Gosh, junior? I hope not. Um, no, I don't know. I, obviously, I want Ernie to do whatever it is that he wants to do. I like, he looks looking at buildings and like all of the construction going on. So I'm like, I mean, you know, contractor or someone who's going to design buildings or something like this. This would be great. Um, but he does also love coming in the kitchen. I mean, granted, there's a lot of knobs that he should turn on that he, that he likes to turn on that he shouldn't and things like that. But he has a little cutter. At, um, they cook a lot. He goes to a little Montessori program mm -hmm. and they actually cook in school all the time. Um, yeah. They make all sorts of things and the kids are in there actively cooking. And they say Ernie's the most interested out of the kids in cooking, but they think it's because he's the most interested in eating as well. <laughs> so... We'll see what happens. Well, that's good, though. It, it is good. Yeah. It's good. You'd be it's sad if all you wanted was chicken nuggets. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about, it's amazing. He can eat three whole eggs and a whole pancake for breakfast, and he's, like, <laughs> literally, like, this big. It's crazy. <laughs> that's amazing. So let's talk, so let's, um, tell me a little bit about uh, the process you go through with your book. This is your second book, and I guess, kind of, what did you learn from your first one that you kind of brought to your second one? Um, and, like, what the process is. What's your creative process for just deciding on which recipes What's you want to include? Um, I, so the first book came out um, right after Girl and the Goat opened, but it was all recipes from before the restaurant. So everybody's like, oh, can I get the recipe for this or that from the restaurants? I'm like, nah, you know, I wrote this book even before I had the restaurants. Um, but I, what I loved about my first book is it was all storytelling. It was all, well, you hear how I like to bibble babble and have no idea what I'm actually talking about. That kind of is what the whole first book is, is a bibble babble of my whole childhood, really. Um, which made it just a fun book, I think, to read. So it was like, you know, recipes that maybe um, are a little older at this point, but even till this day, it's still fun to read all of that stuff. Um, but it was great, we put all these cooking tips with everything. So I think yeah. that carried over is making sure to give tips of things that, I think when you work in the industry, you take for granted that you do something just every day just because that's what you do, mm -hmm. um, like bearding mussels. I was like working on a mussel recipe and my friend was over and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm bearding mussels. And she's like, what are you talking about? So just talking to her about what that process is, you know, and that it's better to beard them yourselves because that way they're as fresh because when you do that, they die and you don't want to get ones that were bearded like three days ago. And 
Um, just going on into details with um, friends of mine that cook at home all the time mm -hmm. and maybe don't know some of the things that we just take for granted. So I think it's really important when you're testing recipes to try as best as you can to think um, like someone that's cooking at home. So we always test the recipes in a home kitchen with home kitchen equipment and not, and it, not we don't really use any fancy equipment in the restaurants to be honest because we're just very simple in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but making sure that it's all stuff that you can do at home. Mm -hmm. um, and we buy all the ingredients from the grocery store. The only one thing in there that's like a little bit that you might not be able to get at the grocery store, we do have one goat recipe for goat neck in there because I love goat neck. And if you happen to, if you're walking around Mariano's one day and there's a goat neck and you're like, well, what am I gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna go to Stephanie's book. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so you can use, but you can sub in lamb or pork for the recipe and it comes out really great. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think, you know, Picking all the recipes, when we first turned in this manuscript, it had a whole nother probably 100 recipes, and they're like, yeah. you've really got to skim this down, Stephanie. <laughs> um, it had a lot of the recipes, the things that didn't make it in there, um, which I need to do another book on, were a lot of the sandwiches at Little Goat. And mm -hmm. we started writing those recipes, and like our Los Drowned sandwich, I don't know if anybody's been to Little Goat, but we have a whole section of sandwiches. And they seem so simple, it's sandwiches, but if you want to actually make the bread, make the meat, make the mayonnaise, make the... Mm -hmm. Um, all of the pickled items, make the kimchi, yeah. whatever it is, it turns out being this like six page recipe to make a sandwich. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, that's a commitment for lunch. <laughs> um, so we thought, I was like, this needs to be its own separate book for like those like hardcore sandwich goers that are like, we are gonna put some effort into this sandwich. <laughs> Well, yeah, I loved your tips. I loved the good stuff sections. And I love that you included your husband and he gave his beer pairings and you used beer in quite a few of the recipes. Yeah, yeah. In here. We, um, so my husband's a beer guy. Um, he does all the beer menus at our restaurants and he talks about beer. Um, he kind of gets up on stage and talks about beer in the same bibble babble fashion, but it has a lot more history to it and he's full of a lot more knowledge than I am on a subject. Um, and so he shares some of that in the book, but whenever we're entertaining, he always has a lot of beers around the house and he's not, he doesn't necessarily pair each beer with a dish in a way like you must drink this with this, but we do stand around and we'll drink a couple different beers with something we're eating and we kind of just talk about it because it's what we like to talk about. Um, like how does it go better? What does this beer do to your taste buds and what does this beer do to it? Um, and then after we've had a lot of those like you know, summer sippers and he digs into his like secret backup like stash of beers. He's like, <laughs> there's only been a hundred of these made in the world um, and busts those out and stuff. So beer becomes part of a lot of our uh, gatherings. Maybe not Ernie's birthday party, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe after you never know, you might sleep. need it yeah. at Ernie's birthday party. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just include that in there because for me that's, uh, you know, a big part of when we're gathering with our friends. Um, so I guess I have, because I know you guys are going to have some questions for Steph, so I don't want to hog all of the time. Um, if you could choose then a recipe uh, from your book that you really feel exemplifies your flavor, or, you know, your flavor, flavor philosophy, what would it be and why? Ooh, that's hard. Um... I saved those for the last I one. Know. <laughs> dun, dun. I know, you're like, uh, we hung out for half an hour before this. You could have given me a heads up about this question. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of different recipes in there that I think the whole book with those is all about flavor and you can see reading through the book, there's not a lot of fancy ingredients, just kind of you're like, oh, I wouldn't have thought to put blueberries with that. Blueberries end up being, somebody was like, there's a lot of blueberries in this book. I was like, I really do like a good blueberry. <laughs> I actually had a whole argument with my whole produce thing. guy this morning, because we can't get local blueberries yet, of course, but there's also the blueberries that we got in, we're just, I was like, these are not as good as the ones I have at my house, what's going on? There's a whole thing. Um, but there's, a, there's one brunch recipe that I like doing, and I like doing it in demos. It's uh, the crunchy, eggy, yummy kimchi and bacon thing. That's what it's called in the book because I didn't know what else to call it. Um, <laughs> but it's based on a, um, a street food called hoi tad, which I, um, is from Thailand. And I think what's cool about it is it's just this, based on a recipe from somewhere that, you know, not that many people have traveled or maybe they have and they saw this on the street and they always wondered what it was and it just looked good. I went to Thailand years ago, but I didn't actually try this when I was there and I need to go back and try it. But I saw a video once of just this uh, woman making this big sort of crepe and throwing a bunch of mussels on it. It turns out to this chopped up kind of like street food crepe thing. And I wanted to put that on the menu, but showcase it with um, put eggs in it, we put bacon in it, we put some kimchi in it, and just kind of turned it into a, our own thing, but kind of highlighting that pancake or crepe batter. Um, but I think that just shows my style in the sense of really trying to showcase foods from around the world that are that you can see by either traveling to a place or traveling just by looking at it online. I mean, honestly, there's so many videos of amazing foods and other people's travels that you can kind of live vicariously through them. Um, Is it true, because one time you said you learned how to do certain things on YouTube. 
Oh, after totally. Back from China. That's how I opened a Chinese <laughs> restaurant. Um, no, and we, we went to China for a month total, but that's not enough. That's like, oh, I went to the United States for a month and I learned how to cook everything. Um, maybe you can, the United States food, like hot dogs and stuff. But, um, but for to actually get the culture of the different regions, um, you'd have to spend, I mean, yeah. years and years and years. Um, so we got a glimpse of Chinese culture by going to some different regions for a short period of time, doing as much eating as we possibly could, um, and then coming back and looking at our pictures and videos and things and just doing research online. And I had to watch, to learn how to make soup dumplings, I had to watch a YouTube video because I had to put it in slow motion so that I could figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I made the first one, I was so proud. I was like, oh my gosh, it looks like a real soup dumpling. Um, <laughs> and now I'm gonna have to make hundreds of these much, much faster and teach other people <laughs> how to make them much, much faster. Um, and now we actually have soup dumpling certified t-shirts for our cooks that have become certified in making them beautifully. Um, but it's a, you know, there's an art to a lot of the things yeah. we do at DuckDuckGo and it took kind of watching other people many times and a lot of um, testing of like trying different dough combinations, understanding different flours and starches and why things do certain things. So um, yeah, YouTube was helpful See in that way. YouTube can make you a top chef too. <laughs> That's my next book. You stole That's the title. Right. Exactly. That's the actual secret you guys are learning tonight. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. I could talk here all night. Um, Stephanie's amazing. And I feel like there's not even, I didn't even get to like a tenth of my questions. But um, I know you, you did guys have a have really large ones. stack of cards there. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, what is that? <laughs> Just wanted to be prepared. Um, so we'll open it up for, um, for questions. To the audience? We have time for just a few questions. Raise your hands and we have a couple of mics circulating. We'll come to you. Hi, Stephanie. Um, Hi. So when you opened your restaurants, how did you come up with the concept? Is it like stuff you enjoy, a gut? Is it like market research? And then how did you follow through to like everything as far as like, you know, coming up with the interior design and the menu items and things like that? Thanks. Um, I mean, we can, I guess looking at Girl and the Goat is a good example because I remember the opening of my first restaurant, I have like blocked most of it out of memory, but um, Girl and the Goat, I, the concept itself, all I knew was that I wanted it to be a casual place that didn't have tablecloths because I had to have tablecloths in my first restaurant because I couldn't afford nice tabletops. And so we put tablecloths and then it made it look fancier and I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> um, but I just wanted it to be a place that you could get good food with like great service, but be super casual and fun. I just wanted the word fun to be part of like, when someone comes in to be able to say, did you have fun? And hopefully their answer is yes. Um, beyond that, like when it came to the menu, yeah, it, I mean, if you've been there, it's like a very much a hodgepodge of stuff and there's not one culture that I stick to and there's not really, the only theme that I stick to is just kind of like bold in your face flavor. Um, we don't really shy away from that. Um, and I think it kind of maybe scared some people off at first. Um, but since then, our, I think that my style has continued to change. So the menu is just like ever evolving, but really just always sticking to like showing people different flavors from different parts of the world they might, might not have had before. And for me, just learning new things. Um, and then so you take it, wanting it to be casual and really not having much more to it than that. So when we met with designers way back when, um, we worked with Karen Harold, who's really awesome. She used to work for 555, now she has her own firm and she's done a lot of beautiful restaurants in the city. But we were the first restaurant she had ever done. So it was kind of a bunch of beginners being like, all right, let's do this. I mean, not that my partners Rob and Kevin hadn't opened other restaurants, but um, she showed things that I had to learn to say what I liked and didn't like. And I think that that was something that took me a little while to learn um, because I think before that I was too shy and I would let something I didn't want to end up letting something into the restaurant and then for years just being like, why did I let them put that ugly thing there? Um, so it was just learning to have an open and honest conversation. I actually was just talking to Karen um, about design in general and she said that for her, um, when you're working with a designer, it's best to talk about just what feeling you want people to have and what you're going for. And she said the hardest thing for her is that people come in with all these pictures from the internet. They're like, let's put something like this. And like they're trying to kind of do, she's like, let me just do my job. I'll find those things. You just tell me what you want the feeling to be. And we really wanted something timeless um, and not too uh, trendy in any sort of way. And I think that Girl on the Go, I think she really captured that. It's like, it's almost eight years old and it still looks, I mean, cool, I guess. Um, <laughs> And we, descri we described it, the words I gave her, I was like, rustic with a bit of badass. And I think she got that too, um, with the burnt wood wall and stuff. So I think it's really just, you know, really thinking about what feeling you want people to have and being open about things and um, 
Yeah, because you're gonna probably be stuck with the design for a while. When we were opening Little Goat, just real quick, we had a different designer that we worked with and she ended up designing the whole space and the bakery side and the upstairs I love and we still have those. Um, I did just add new wallpaper by myself, but I'm just saying, it's real pretty. Um, but on the other side in the diner, I sat down two weeks before we were gonna open. I was sitting there with my two partners and I looked around and I was like, you guys, I have to say it, I freaking hate this. It looks terrible. It's ugly, it's boring, there's nothing fun about it, there's no color, there's none of this. Like, this is blocking this, this is terrible. And they said, they're like, oh, we're so glad you said that, we don't like it either. And so we ended up having Karen come in and kind of save the day and like in two weeks she turned it around and put a bunch of like fun wallpaper and color and all of these, was able to kind of add just enough to it to make it to what I truly love now. Um, but definitely just, you know, always, don't be afraid to say your own opinion on what you're thinking about design. And it is, it's so personal, you know? Um, so for me, you know, as far as uh, worrying about like what the market thinks of certain things and things, I didn't really, not that I don't love you all, but I didn't take it into consideration <laughs> when I'm doing my menus. Um, the only thing I do take into consideration now is for sure um, making sure that there's something for everyone and making sure that there is something for everyone with different allergies and different dietary restrictions. Um, we try to just make sure that that's part of all of our menus um, so everybody can come in and have a good time and be comfy. You mentioned Harvest Fest. Can you tell us a little bit more about that upcoming event? Yeah, sure. Um, I thought that was my publicist asking and I look over and she's like, I don't have a microphone. I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, so, a few years ago, I was actually sitting at a meeting with Katie up here. Um, we were sitting outside, it was like July, and we were talking about, I mean, we, there's so many amazing festivals in the city, and we were like, really, we really want to do one to showcase Fulton Market area, where like, um, our restaurants are, and where Paul Kahn's restaurants are. Um, Paul Kahn, you know, put Public in there first, and is the first one to get in there and really like make the neighborhood start to change. So I went to Paul, and I was like, would you want to start a festival? I and mean, he's like, yeah, we've been thinking the same thing. So. We put our heads together and um, put together Fulton Market Harvest Fest. It was one day the first year. Then last year it was Saturday and Sunday and we had about 20,000 guests that came through. Um, but it's a big street festival that's got a music stage on one side and a KitchenAid demo stage on the other side. Um, all of like the, like my chef friends and favorite chefs from the city that do demos and such, but we also have a lot of restaurants that never do street festivals that come and do food. Like Monteverde is doing food this year, Spiaggia, Girl and the Goat, Publican, um, places that you can't necessarily find at a lot of the other street festivals. Um, Honey Butter Fried Chicken, I think, is gonna come down. Um, so some of our favorite restaurants are just coming. So it's kind of, just wanted to throw a giant party, really, in the street. Um, and then we fly in some chefs from out of town, too. So September 14th to 16th, put it in your calendar. Hello. Um, I'm over here. Oh, hi. The hi. microphone just keeps peering. And I know. <laughs> so earlier you were talking about how you started cooking with your family when you were really young and then how you went to Michigan. And as somebody who's going to college next year and who's also a fan of good eating, I was wondering if you had any tips about how to maintain eating well and yummily while also going to a place where you don't have the same resources as you do at home. Ooh, um, I mean, I think there's always, what, do you know where, what city you're going to school in? Yes, Northfield, Minnesota. Oh. Um, <laughs> I've not been to Northfield, Minnesota, so I can't, um, but I mean, every town has to have something that's a hidden gem of a restaurant, so you have to talk to local people there and find those places, but I think then you just have to find a way to do some cooking. I did... Well, I probably did minimal cooking in my dorm room because I was scared of getting in trouble. I said I don't like getting yelled at. Um, yeah, I guess it's gonna have to, I mean, that would be just about getting together and cooking and um, I don't know, every city has got to have, or every town has got to have a place that's um, tasty and has some good things, but you'll have to let me know what you find. Hi, I'm just curious to know if there's a story behind why the goat has become such a key element in your brand. Oh sure, my, um, so my last name in French, we say Izard, but it's Izard in French, and it's a mountain goat that lives in the Pyrenees Mountains. If you look up Izard mountain, or Izard mountain goat, there's a picture, it's kind of like a goat antelope thing, but one of those cool ones that climbs up all in the mountains. Um, and I, when I was getting ready to open Girl and the Goat, I ran into my friend, Quang. Um, I was like coming out of the gym, and I was like, Quang, oh my god. Uh, we're opening this restaurant, it was, it was gonna be called The Drunken Goat. I was like, we're opening up this restaurant called The Drunken Goat. And he did a painting for me of a girl and a goat and like these dancing beer cans and stuff. Um, and we ended up having to change the name for legal reasons from the cheese lady. Um, and 
But I was like, what am I going to name it? I'm Aside from being drunken, what else am I? Um, but I, we ended up going with Girl and the Goat because of that painting. But then he also, he drew this goat, which has become our little like mascot, I guess. And now it's like spinning over a little goat. And um, when you're walking around the neighborhood, there's all these people with goat t-shirts on. Um, it's just fun. I love having a little mascot. I don't know. And somebody's like, what's his name? I'm like, well, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl or what its name is. It's just the goat. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for bringing three awesome restaurants to Chicago. Oh, sure. Jens, I mean, you really led the charge West Loop, which has now become such a booming epicenter for us of beyond Randolph Restaurant Row. Um, first question, do we have anything else to expect from you soon? <laughs> and um, what are your thoughts on what's to come? Because it just seems like when every time we turn around, there's, there's something new in that area. Um, yeah, I would say that I do not have another restaurant opening in that area anytime soon, so I will not be adding to the hustle and bustle over there. Um, but I think, you know, just looking at what's happening over there, there's hotels and more restaurants and everything opening all the time, so, um, you know, what to expect from that area is it to just keep evolving and keep getting, you know, better in some ways, crazier in some ways. As someone that has businesses there, I, you know, I love it, I think, for a place like Little Goat, it's so great to have hotels coming and just to be able to be part of what that neighborhood is um, is sort of known for. Um, but yeah, it's definitely getting crazy. We'll see sort of what happens with... It's yeah, insane. definitely can't park there anymore, <laughs> I'll say that. You um, can barely walk. <laughs> yeah, and as far as for what's next for me, well, I'm, I mean, I cannot tell you. See, I'm looking at my publicist. I cannot tell you. <laughs> Top secret intel, but possibly something sometime soon. And yeah, that's it. I've said too much already. <laughs> <Boosh>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great place to end. I'm afraid we're all out of time today, but a big round of applause for our presenters. Thank you Thank so much you. for being here.